Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Joy Pachuau, a professor at the Center for Historical Studies at JNU in New Delhi. She is currently at the Program in Agrarian Studies at the Macmillan Center on a Fulbright Nehru Academic Excellence Fellowship. Her research interests include the history of Christianity in India and the sociocultural history of Northeast India. Today, we'll talk with Professor Pachuau about her book, Being Mizu, Identity and Belonging in Northeast India. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Glad to be here. Let's start with your book. Tell us about it. Well, as the title suggests, the book is about a people group in Northeast India called Mizo. And uh, the Northeast in India is, constitutes eight states. And uh, uh, the Mizos usually inhabit the state of Mizoram. So these are people groups that are identified as uh, scheduled tribes by the Indian constitution, mm -hmm. or alternatively can also be called as indigenous people groups. So um, the Mizos are, is a generic term for a group of tribes that inhabit the region and surrounding areas, including Burma, and so the book is essentially traces how they constitute themselves, how they understand themselves, and uh, how in history they have uh, grown to be this people group known as the Mizo. So the book essentially talks about that and yeah, looks at the history of, of the people. Okay, and what drew you to this topic? Well, uh, firstly, I am from the region, okay. so I'm from the state, so that's one of the <laughs> interest groups and, and that also you know, it enables research, but also because Northeast India as a whole is a region that is relatively unknown to the larger world, but also to India. Mm -hmm. You know, people rarely understand the region as separate people groups, as separate identities. Even if they know the region, it's more or less like as a region, but they do not know the specifics of the region. So, okay. so it's uh, it's a means of bringing out the region to the larger public as well. And there's not much literature in English on the region as a whole as well. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons, I mean, those are some of the interests. And, and it is a fascinating history as well and a fascinating uh, story of a people. So that's mm -hmm. the reason why I wanted to look uh, at uh, and study the region. Yeah. Okay, and how are you doing <coughs> the research? What's the methodology? Well, I'm essentially a historian by training, but this, I mean, if when you're studying indigenous groups like that, you have to sort of understand the, the uh, sort of the, the, the methodology of anthropology as well. Mm -hmm. So it's basically historical anthropology. And so um, I look at a lo lot of archives, uh, uh, I mean, records, British records and things like that. So it's a lot of archival work as well as talking to people and ethnographic research in that sense, mm -hmm. yeah. So. Okay, um, so the Mizu are in the, um, it's, it's almost kind of, um, how big of a territory would you call it uh, in terms of, um, well, as it relates to India? Yeah. I mean, it's very small and the, the continent of India is, is pretty large. Well, yeah, um, Mizoram by itself is about 21,000 square kilometers. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure how much that is, but okay. yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah. So it's about 21, and the population is about a million. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I was just uh, yeah. The density of the population is about 50 people per okay. square kilometer. Yeah, so square and kilometers. Yeah. Would I be correct in saying it's kind of like a, a, a peninsula off of off of the main land? Yeah. Um, what's surrounding? What are the countries around it? Is Bangladesh one yeah, of them? Yeah, Bangladesh is to the east. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the northeast as a region has eight states, and okay. Mizoram is one of the states okay. of the northeast, right? Okay. So Mizoram is surrounded by uh, Bangladesh to the east and Burma to the west. Okay. Yeah, so, and of, of course to the south, Bangladesh as well. So, and it's only connected to the rest of India and the north, yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, so. How does mainland India view the Northeast? You had mentioned that you know some you know aren't even very familiar with it. Yeah. Are there any other um, views that are held predominantly? Or yeah, well, um, in India at the moment there's a lot of debate about uh, 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 regarding racism with with regard to people of the Northeast. So there is you know if you look at um, student groups who come to the, uh, to what 
is referred to as mainland India by, I mean, of course, <laughs> that's the subcontinent is referred to as mainland India, although it doesn't really signify that. But anyway, so when a lot of students come into the region, to come to mainland India, they suffer a lot of racism. And, you know, people do not give them houses to rent or, um, or you know, just the other day there was a student from another state in northeast India uh, who was beaten up by the landlord and things like that. So there is a lot of racism uh, that, that the people of the region have to suffer. And, and what does that <coughs> stem from, do you think? Well, um, just that's being different? Just or? being different okay. at one level. And also, you know, uh, it could stem from various things. Uh, in recent times, um, um, yeah, it's basically not knowing the region, I think that would be, and also not knowing the region as being a part of India as well. And, you know, you know, when you go, when, when we, when we go to the, what is known as the mainland, people think you're from, you know, foreign countries and, mm -hmm. and usually the people of the region don't like that, you know, if you're called a Chinese or when, when the rest of the country is your own country, right? right interesting. <laughs> so, so things like that. So people have to suffer a lot of racism as well in, in many forms, whether it's an education. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, because, you know, the word tribe in India has different connotations and mm -hmm. people in the region are referred to as tribes. So, you know, tribe has its own sort of set of baggages that people right. have to overcome as mm -hmm. well. So I think uh, so. I think it's a lot of it's a, you know things to do with, right, with right. those kinds of understanding. Um, do mm. the Mizzou look very um, physically? Do they look very different from um, those on mainland? Yeah, yeah. Well, <coughs> um, you know, most of the region uh, speaks a different language group, which okay. is tibeto burman Of course, there are other language groups as well, like the Austroasiatic and Indo-European as well. But the main predominant people groups, you could say, uh, speak tibeto burman So, which which also means that, as a people, uh, people, uh, you know, uh, in 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 the physiognomy, in a way, people are much more closer to Southeast Asia than they are to the Indian subcontinent, as it were. So, okay. so in terms of difference, definitely physically, there is a lot of difference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. What about religion? Does um, how does religion play a role in in the Mizo? Yeah. So uh, most, well, almost all ethnic Mizos are Christian. So, uh, and these were the result of 19th, uh, 20th century conversions. Within a matter of 50, 60 years, the entire people group became Christian. So, uh, even prior to the adoption of Christianity, uh, the people as a region identified uh, themselves on the basis of religion, on the basis of their sort of local beliefs. So, if a person wanted to change his or her tribe there was a there was a there was a sort of ritual by which you could conv conv you could adopt another tribe and if you wanted to adopt another tribe you had to adopt the sort of religion of the other tribe mm -hmm. you know so in a way who you were was dependent upon the religion that you adopted okay so uh, so having adopted christianity as a people group i think it becomes very important in self identification who you are is so you will rarely find, you know, Mizos who are non-Christian because if you are a non-Christian, you cannot be Mizo in a way. Okay. That's the way things are at the moment, at least. Yeah. Okay. And did you look at um, any examples of that actually happening with a specific person who decided they did not believe in in that religion any longer, and and how the interaction with the rest of the tribe changed? Um, so at the moment, you will not find people who, um, well, uh, who who don't associate themselves with Christianity. You know, even if if they are not mainline church groups, they are usually, you know, uh, belong to sort of factions of Christianity. So there are different kinds of denominations of Christianity, but mm -hmm. most are, mostly all are Christian, right? Okay. So. Uh, so you wouldn't find that today, but in the past, of course, in, in, in history, you know, the adoption was not very simple. It was not straightforward. So people were, so the Christians were, you know, thrown out of villages and, and uh, they had to create their own villages. So there was a lot of tension in the past in the adoption of Christianity, no doubt. But currently at the moment, 
apart from very, very small sort of groups um, that constitute themselves differently, you would rarely find anyone who is not a Christian. Okay. Okay. Um, because I was just thinking, for instance, um, Scientology, for instance, here, if, if you no longer believe in Scientology, you basically have to leave that all behind and, and leave. Yeah. Um, but that's not the instance <coughs> with the Mizu. Yeah. Oh. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, people rarely sort of, I don't know, move forward. Uh -huh of Christianity in a way. If they have moved into Christianity, people, mostly people have stopped at being Christian. They haven't moved to any other thing okay. else at the moment, at least, okay. so far. I don't know how things will change in the next few years or okay. what, yeah, but okay. yeah. So what are some of your findings in your book? Well, um, and how long have you been studying the Mizzou? Well, um, the Mizzou has, I've been do, working on them since, I mean, as really looking at their histories for the past 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. And um, so the book is, uh, I think, interesting in the sense that, uh, you know, uh, the Mizos were not one tribe, as I was saying earlier. They, 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 they constitute different tribes and, in fact, at a point of time would have had different languages. But now, uh, more or less, uh, they cons within the state of Mizoram, they consider themselves uh, Mizo and they speak the Mizo language. Mm -hmm. But the same tribes that constitute the Mizo are, are, are constitute themselves differently in other regions. Mm -hmm. Like in Burma, they would consider themselves different tribes. In the neighboring state of Manipur, they would consider themselves as the constitutive tribes. Whereas mm -hmm. in Mizoram, they've all come together as Mizo, generally speaking. Huh? So, um, uh, so the book essentially traces the history of that sort of homogenization in a way. Mm -hmm. But um, the reason why I look at the creation of this identity is because even as I was studying um, so, uh, the society, I found that uh, you know, death and death practices were an important way of bringing people together. And let's talk about that. How yeah. so? Yes, yeah, so for instance, in the capital city of Aizol, you would have, um, you know, uh, a s well, let's first of all, let me say that the sit, the, you know, it's a really homogenous society, right? Mm -hmm. But then you would have uh, sort of people coming from other regions as well. But then you find that even people who come from other regions tend to constitute themselves as Mizo. Yeah. Yeah, tend to, in the in, in course of time, you know, identify themselves as Mizo. So if you have s sort of a Mizo woman who's married a person from mainland India, very often the person from mainland India is incorporated as a, as a Mizo in time. And do they also self-identify as Mizo? Uh, you know, if they themselves don't, even if they don't, in a way, I mean, they, it would be very difficult for them to identify, self-identify themselves as Mizo. Their children often take up their mothers, you know, so even though our, uh, the Mizo society is a patrilineal society, mm -hmm. the children of, you know, uh, uh, of Mizo women and non-Mizo uh, person would co identify themselves as Mizo. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's a very, it sort of absorbs people in, in a way. Mm -hmm. And you find how, 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 how I mean, how does one um, r see that? And that is where I come, the death and death practices. Because all those who are considered Mizo mm -hmm. usually will be buried in, in, in the locality, uh, graveyard or cemetery, uh, and given the, the, the rituals of a, of a Mizo. You know? So even yes. if you're technically a non-Mizo, if mm -hmm. you've been adopted as a Mizo, then you have that sense of, and people want to be buried in their lo local graveyard or local cemetery. They don't want to be buried elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So if a person dies, say in Delhi, the body is flown back and has to be buried in the locality graveyard. Mm -hmm. So in a way, the burial in a graveyard sort of fulfills his identity as a Mizo as well, you know? It, okay. it completes his, his journey as being a Mizo. So, you know, for instance, if a person is buried elsewhere, then 
you know, people think of the family as being, uh, you know, as, as feel very sad for the family of the person who's ha who had for some reason to be buried elsewhere, you know. So the idea, I mean, the, the phrase that is used is the burial of the head, you know. I mean, the, the head is a metonym for the whole body. So mm -hmm. they say lupum, which means that so-and-so had to bury the head of their son or their daughter in another place. And so it's worth grieving about because they could not bring the body back into the locality. Mm -hmm. Uh, graveyard. So how did this, you know, in the past, uh, this was not the case. You know, this identification, because uh, the Mizos were generally um, um, uh, migrant workers, uh, uh, warriors in a way. So okay. people migrated from place to place. So there was, the territory was not sacred in a way. But it's only a recent sort of 20th century phenomenon where uh, where the region become a territory becomes sacred and people have to be buried in a particular locality. It wasn't so in the past. So I was just tracing how that happens, how there is sort of uh, a territorialization of identity. How does that take place? Mm -hmm. And it has a lot to do with, you know, the arrival of colonialism, the arrival of Christianity, and the pinning of a people to a territory. Otherwise, people were always on the move. You know, the history of the Mizos is, is is an arrival from further east, further east meaning Burma and and even beyond northern Burma or northern Myanmar, mm -hmm. and even beyond that. So people trace their origins to to China sometimes, and they say that there were these waves of migrations that occurred in the past, and and so they were in what is known as Mizoram today at the time of the arrival of the British, mm -hmm. and the British forbid that moving around, and so then they became tied to a particular territory territory and so the territorialization of them leads to territorialization of them as a people even in terms of death you know right, so right. so that's how I sort of traced it backwards in a way right. and, and looked at the history that of the people. That is interesting. Do we have, um, are there people migrating from Burma and China and those parts you mentioned to Northeast India today or has that pretty much stopped? Well people are, I mean especially at the time of um, of, uh, of the dictatorship in Burma, a lot of uh, people did move into Mizoram. Uh, the neighboring state in Burma for Mizoram is the Chin state. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people would move into uh, to, to, to Mizoram during that period of time. But I think it's much less now with democracy coming in and more opportunities. But also because of uh, you know, modern day technology, a lot of the Chin migrate not to Mizoram, but to the U.S. So, okay. <laughs> so that's, that's, uh, okay. that's, yeah. So there are lots of Chin communities here. Okay. Yeah. Is there any chance, um, since it doesn't seem like many are migrating to that part, and some are actually, you know, leaving to go to mm. other places, that the Mizu will die out? Is that ever a concern? I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, at the moment, uh, the, because you know, uh, even though they're they're they they're, they're called tribal or scheduled tribes and things like that, the Mizos have the highest rate of education in the country as a state, mm -hmm. highest or second highest. They usually at that point. So it's a very sort of literate society. Okay. It's uh, it's not so developed in terms of economy, mm -hmm. but uh, in terms of the economy because it's a really mountainous region. Um, the highest peak is about 7,000 feet or something of that mm -hmm. sort. And so, so it's a very mountainous region as well. So, um, so, but people are doing well because of the high literary standards mm -hmm. compared to the rest of the country. So I don't think there is uh, okay. yeah, an, any danger of the okay. people dying out. And also, you know, because uh, as I was saying, Christianity is a very, uh, important part of people's social life and so um, people are extremely uh, and because of literacy as well there is a sort of um, you know the high levels of literacy high levels of literature local literature Mizo literature so it's in fact a very thriving culture in that sense okay. yeah okay and as I was saying earlier even if Mizo, if Mizo women marry non mizos mm -hmm. their children are always incorporated okay. as mizos as well so right, as right. well so yeah good point so what do you conclude in your book well <laughs> the conclusion of course is uh, is to talk about well 
you know, the, the constitution of identity, how that happens historically. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, you know, that identities are constructed. You know, uh, there might be a pre primordial notion of how people understand themselves, mm -hmm. but people build on that historically in order to be able to understand, uh, in order to be able to uh, understand themselves. So identities are usually a created identity. You know, the Mizo identity may morph into something else in future. Mm -hmm. You never know. But uh, uh, and it may the identity today, the way they see it, may not be something that people in the past practiced or understood. So it may morph into something else. So there's it's always a sort of a process of construction. Is uh, yeah. So that's basically what the book okay. talks about. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Pleasure. For more information about Professor Pachuao and her research, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.